In the 20th century, many old buildings with design flaws were demolished or modified through a natural selection process, which means they are an altered state rather than an original state. This is an application of Darwin's theory of natural selection to modification of old buildings, which means buildings should adapt to the new world to survive or be pulled down. So, it's argued to be unfair to criticize the demolition, although some people believe that whether to be remained should be decided based on their nature and functions. As the world became more and more connected, the styles evolved, but even in modern construction, there is still an importance in honoring the cultural nuances in the built environment. Research has shown that in certain situations silent meetings actually work better. Specifically, if the goal of a meeting is to brainstorm or solve a problem, silent meetings have been shown to generate better ideas. But why? Solutions to a problem will often be a novel idea, and novel ideas challenge convention. They can rock the boat and make people feel uncomfortable. But when participants gather around a table and generate written solutions in silence, a safe space is created. Novel ideas can emerge and people are less afraid of feeling embarrassed. Silent meetings also circumvent negative effects of something called production blocking. In a conventional meeting, only one person at a time can speak. As you wait your turn, the conversation may shift and you may lose your opportunity to raise an idea. Silent meetings allow for everyone to express ideas simultaneously. So how do you create a silent brainstorming meeting? Have people write down their ideas independently, then sort them into clusters, discuss, and vote on the ideas that people like. The key is to let the initial ideation phase happen independently and in silence so we can separate egos from ideas. So the researchers then turn to hot Neptunes and warm Jupiters, these are Jupiters with slightly longer orbits. They found only two potentials nearby planets among 222 hot Neptures. And of the 31 warm Jupiters, five showed evidences of a companion. The findings are in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The current theory is that hot Jupiters formed and then migrated in towards their stars. There are two kinds of stress. The first one is little stress, which happens in special circumstances such as exams or other competitions, and can be considered as a motivation to improve performances. You always think about stress as a really bad thing, but it's not. Look on the bright side, and some stress is good for you. Stress can be something that makes you better, but it is a question of how much, how long, and how you interpret or perceive it. The other one is what we usually talk about, caused by poor time management. Good time management is essential if you are to handle a heavy workload without excessive stress.
Time management helps you to reduce long-term stress by giving you direction when you have too much work to do. It puts you in control of where you are going and helps you to increase your productivity. By being efficient in your use of time, you should enjoy your current work more and should find that you able to maximize the time outside work to relax and enjoy life. Poor time management is a major cause of stress. I'm sure we have all had the feeling that there is too much to do and not enough time. Because of the economic model, the newspaper industry has been shrinking drastically from the last 50 years of the 20th century in some states of America. Also as the economic model changed, newspapers increased the cash flow. However, there are still some newspaper industries losing money because of a decrease in advertising and buyers. They can't find buyers. Only a few newspapers have positive cash flow. In late 1990s, when management consultants wrote books with titles such as The War for Talent, etc., there was a great deal of talk about the talent wars. And I think that was the bursting of the bubble with the bursting of the dot dumb bubble and a sense of the people who had been the masters of the universe just a few weeks before we're out on the streets looking for jobs. I think this created a reaction, it gave me ideas that there was a war for talent. In fact, all of things we saw in the late 1990s are reasserting themselves now. All those shortages are reasserting themselves, and the real reason the auditing was really the bursting of the bubble, not the shortages of talent. There are very profound structural forces which are creating these talent shortages. One is the fact that the nature of the economy is changing, it's putting more and more premium upon intellectual skills, analytical skills, creative skills which are in short supply. So, there is a demand increase, but there is also a decrease in supply. Because we are seeing now the aging of the baby boom, the shirking of populations in Europe and Japan and not very long in China as well and the sort of stabilization of the population of the United States so we see a time when there is a greater demand for intellectual skills and slowing down in the supply of people who possess those skills and also a mismatch between the sort of things that people are learning at school and university. And the sort of things the economy is placing a premium on particularly with the shortage of trained people in the sciences and engineering. They also modified the precipitation at the transplant sites, based on altered rainfall estimates. For the first year, the plants did great, producing more biomass and churning out more oxygen for us. But their productivity went down for the rest of the decade. What happened? 
Warming did speed up the nitrogen cycle, which should have increased nitrogen's availability as plant fertilizer. But a lot of the nitrogen left the soil through runoff or uptake into the atmosphere. Well, that's one aspect of what's called, reducing government, modifying government, to be more precise. Another aspect of it is what's called, devolution, reducing, moving governmental power from the federal to the state level. And that has a kind of a rationale which you hear all over the time, place. For example, there was an op-ed a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times by John Cogan, Hoover Institute at Stanford who has pointed out what he called a philosophical issue that divides the Democrats from the Republicans. Because of our mounting credit card debt and monthly payments that far exceed our family's incomes and my kids will also join the class of citizens who can't rely on their parents for college support. Do I wish I'd chosen another educational route? You bet. Perhaps trade school, I thought that being a plumber might not be such a bad gig. But if your job aspirations require a four-year degree, take my advice and choose a college you can afford, both during and after graduation. Take a realistic look at your anticipated income, and factor in priorities that don't carry a price, like the spouse and children you might want to have someday. I am going to talk today really mostly about what I do as a curator here at the National Museum of Australia, but I want to draw some kind of generalities from that in terms of how this series of curatorial practices if you like, tools, techniques, and methods that I think could be of interest to your students and of interest to you in developing extension history courses. I want to talk about what I do as a curator and then from that also talk a little bit about the kinds of history that I think museums are particularly good at creating and communicating. Well, it's like, why is Australian housing is so expensive? Essentially, it's showing of how well the Australian economy has been doing over the last 15 years. We have had 15 years more, or less of an uninterrupted economic growth during which average earning has been raised by close to 90%. While over the course of that period, the standard variable mortgage rate has roughly halved. That meant that the amount which a typical home-buying household can afford to borrow under rules, which aren't strictly applied, as they used to be had more than doubled. Over the same period, rising immigration and falling average household size has meant that the number of households looking for accommodation has risen by about one and a half million. That's around 200,000 more than the number of dwellings has increased by. So, you have had a substantial increase in the purchasing power of households.
They then infected the mice with a common childhood infection called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Mice who ate the dog dust were protected against RSV infection symptoms, like inflamed, mucus-coated airways, suggesting exposure helped them stave off the virus. Those mice also had more diverse communities of gut bacteria than control mice did. The researchers say our pets' microbes may colonize our gut too, and help the immune system learn to respond to infections. Before we consider international environmental law and climate change, we need to consider domestic legislation, as it is within the sovereign states that international law is put into practice. This reflects the environmentalists' maxim, think globally, and act locally. United Kingdom legislative control over the impacts of man's activity on the environment is not new. As long ago as the reign of Charles II the main concern was the production of smoke from the burning of sea coal. Almost all areas of trade and industry were subject to very detailed legislative controls at that time, although some were governed by self-regulation in the form of guilds, which regulated both supply and methods of production. However, the measures implemented were mostly ineffective because then, as now, the specifying of legal duties and standards without providing any appropriate enforcement merely indicated good intentions but were of little practical effect. The next stage was prompted by the Industrial Revolution with the urbanization of society and its profound effects on the environment. Local industrialists used the Adam Smith model to maximize their economic benefit, but this was to the detriment of the local environment with the operation of Gresham's Law, that is, the bad drives out the good. Those industrialists who were concerned for either the health of their employees 